Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, I want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, what to do with the snake in your house. And um, a lot of people don't realize that they have a snake in their house because this snake that I'm talking about is invisible. Now, there are people who will bring dangerous animals into their house as pets. I remember around... Uh, Oh, 25, 30 years ago, this couple here at the Lake of the Ozarks invited Loretta and I over for dinner. And when we got there, they had a pet cheetah and a pet leopard. And they were not little. And they were in their house. They'd raised them. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can do that. You know, raise a carnivorous animal and get away with it. But every now and then, that animal will resort back to what it was bred for. And you've heard stories of people who've had a tiger or a lion or something, and they've had it for years, and then all of a sudden it turned on them. I mean, a, a Vegas act happened here a few years ago. Remember, an, an animal turned on the trainer. Things like that happen. And they say, why did that happen? Hello? They're carnivorous. And when they get hungry, you're meat. Now, I also heard a story. I have a friend in Australia who went in to get a cup of coffee one morning in his press pot. They have press pot coffee there. And an eight-foot snake rolled out from behind his refrigerator. Now, in Australia, that's kind of normal. Okay, you've got to understand. There's more animals that can kill you in Australia than any other place in the world. That's true. But he didn't put it there. And uh, when it rolled out, he had a choice to make. He had a choice to make. Kind of like the guy down in Texas. You may have heard this story. I've heard other ministers even tell about this. There was a, a man and his wife, and they were going to redecorate or remodel, move things around in their living room. And the kids were in the living room watching TV. And so they said, well, you know, we want to move some furniture around, kind of rearrange things. And so they had the kids get up and walk away. And they went to move the couch. And behind the couch, under the couch, was a huge rattlesnake. Now, evidently, it had been there for a while. You have a choice to make when the snake shows up. Now, what some people do, if you paralleled Physically, what some people do spiritually, they would just say, well, let's just don't go in the living room anymore. That snake's in there. Or let's just shut off the kitchen. Don't want to mess with the snake. And, and a lot of people are putting up with stuff they don't need to put up with. And you need to know that when the snake shows up, what you need to do. And the first thing that you should do is kill the snake. Now, you can let that rattlesnake live in your home, but you'll be living in fear, and you'll be nervous the entire time it's there because you know that snakes bite, but don't want to bother the snake. Don't make the snake mad. You know, if the snake's over there, then you kind of stay over here. you got to quit putting up with the snake in your house. It's time to cut the head off the snake. I don't like snakes. I remember walking out into my garage once when we lived at our other house. Late at night, and the light was off, and I was barefoot. The snake touched the bottom of my foot. Well, after I calmed down and quit crying, <laughs> I killed the snake. I'm not going to let that snake live in my garage. Now, when I turned on the light and went and got my, my piece of conduit, that's what I used to, you know, I'd get, choom, you know. Now, my dad, I remember my dad found a snake one time in our cabin when we used to come down to the lake. He, man, he just got out a rifle. 
I'm, I'm serious. He went and got, he got his deer rifle. And we're downstairs in this little room where the water tank is and everything. I'm thinking he's going to blow up the house. Yeah. He hated snakes too. But I'll tell you what. There's something inside of us that knows when danger is around. You know, danger, Will Robinson. Danger. You know, we, we know when danger is around. But you can't just take it and set it aside. You have to deal with it. Now God gave us authority over all the power of the enemy. He gave us the double barrel shotgun to kill the snake. He gave us the tools. We must use them. Now, I've got good news for you today. You have a deliverer who will deliver you out of any problem that comes in your life. And in the same way that somebody stupidly would put up with a snake in their house, they would just allow it to, to be there and just kind of sidestep it and be careful. Too many people are putting up with the, with the devil in their house and just sidestepping it and avoiding it we need to deal with issues. We need, to, we need to correct things. And here's what's sad, is we're putting up with stuff we don't have to put up with. We're dealing with things we don't need to deal with. We have the tools to just whack the snake. What are you going to do about the snake in your house? Well, let's talk about how the snake got there. No, 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 no. You don't stand around with a snake crawling around trying to figure out, I wonder where that snake came from. I wonder if it has friends. How many snakes am I going to have to kill? Maybe I'll just talk to the snake. Or maybe I can pet the snake and it'll calm down. No, listen, the devil is the devil. He's a snake, and he's always going to be a snake. It doesn't matter. And, and he's a deceiver. And no matter how much you try to negotiate with him, he, he's a liar. Jesus said in John 8, that the devil was a liar. He said he always has been, always will be. He doesn't change. I know this is an idiom that doesn't work, but a snake doesn't change its spots. You know what I'm talking about. 2 Peter 2.4 Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Well, that word temptations there can also be translated trials or tribulations. God knows how to deliver you out. And He's told you that He will deliver you out. And so, much like my story of the bus monitor, we need to believe that he's going to come through with his word no matter how long it takes. Sometimes it may take longer than others. But we need to be patient and wait upon the Lord. Serve him and be patient. He will come through. Now, what hinders the power of God. It's doubt and unbelief. Now where does doubt and unbelief come from? Doubt and unbelief comes from listening to the snake. Because the snake will say, well, God didn't come through. He, he must not always fulfill his word. No, here's the deal. God always fulfills his word. He never, say never, he never lies. He never, say never, never, never forgets a promise. And he always, say always, always. comes through what, with what he said he would do. That's the God we serve. But the devil will try to tell you that you are some type of an exception to the rule. 
And see, a lot of people think that. You know, there was a survey one time, and they surveyed a bunch of second and third grade kids. And they asked them when they were going to die. And most of them said, never. And when they asked them, well, you know that everybody dies. And they would stop and think about it. They would come back with some reason why they were the exception to the rule. That at some point in time, there would be some discovery and they would never have to die. Now, we're talking about second and third graders here. And then as they got older, they began to realize the reality of our physical life. You are not the exception to God's rule. Everything that he said in his word to the church applies to you personally. Now, in life there are times when unexpected things happen. Sometimes it's suddenly... Sometimes it builds over time and the problem begins to fester and then there's an explosion. But here's the deal. The problem must be faced. To ignore the problem is ignorance. I mean, that's where ignore and ignorance and ignorant, all those are root words. You, to ignore something is ignorant. Sounds like a hillbilly talking, doesn't it? But whether it's the call in the middle of the night and something unexpected happens, no matter what it is, when you get to the point where you feel you just cannot continue with the pain and the pressure that's coming against you, and sometimes there's pain and pressure that builds up within a family, what do you do? Well, look, you need to know, once again, you need to know the source of your trial. See, some people think that when you become a Christian, all your troubles go away. How many of you would agree with that right now? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, becoming a Christian changes your eternal life. But you're still here on this earth. You know, Jesus said, Lord, I pray in John chapter 17, he said, I pray, Father, that you not take them out of the world that you leave them in the world because when we're in the world we can change the world they're not of the world we're not of the world we are not the world but we are in the world and until the return of Jesus and we get our glorified resurrected bodies we are still subject to the pressures of the world and the world will put pressure on you any way possible to get you to not be a witness for Jesus look what is it that the devil wants anyway? The devil wants to destroy the plan of God. And he wants to do it any way he can. He did it through Adam and Eve. And then he did it through the angels coming down in Genesis 6. He did it through the giants. He tried doing it through Pharaoh, Herod, Killed all the babies. I mean, he, he has done so much. But through all of this, God had a plan, and Jesus died on the cross. God raised him from the dead, and now we have the church. But the devil hasn't given up. See, he is so mental that he believes his own lies. He believes that somehow he can defeat God. But we've seen that the prophecies of the Word, that God, who has been in the future and seen what's going to happen, He's prophesied to us the victory that we have. See, here's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. God is omnipresent. The devil is not. You know, when people say, well, the devil's after me. Well, probably not the devil, not Lucifer, not Satan. Because he can only be at one place at one time. And for you to think of out of all the billions of people on the earth, he picked you because you're his greatest threat. He didn't pick you. He has assigned others to you. All right? 
So you have other, peop- other demonic spirits, other fallen angels assigned to you to take you down. Why does he want to take you down? He wants to destroy God's plan. See, we now have the Spirit of God living inside of us, and he knows that. When he attacks you, he's, he's attacking the Spirit of God directly. More so than in Old Testament times. See, in Old Testament times, he tried to get to God through the people. Now he's trying, because of the church, he's trying to get to God who's within the people. And he thinks he can win. Well, he's a loser and a liar. And you need to know who your enemy is. Your enemy is not your sister-in-law. Your enemy is not Bob the Builder. Who is your enemy? See, when people are acting up and acting against you, there's a source behind it. See, your trial is actually a trial of faith. And a lot of people are shadow boxing. Some people have made it a game to play with the devil. You don't play patty cake with the devil. Now listen, let me say something about spiritual warfare. Yes, there is spiritual warfare, all right? If there wasn't spiritual warfare, we would have been told to dress casual. But we weren't. We were told to put on the full armor of God. So there is spiritual warfare. Yes, we are to battle. But the fight that we fight is the fight of faith. That's the only fight in the New Testament the church has been told to fight. We fight the good fight of faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is, in its simplest form, is believing God. So, in other words, it's a battle to believe God. Are you following me? Because too often we go by what we see instead of by what God says. And he tells us, quit looking at what you see, go by what I say. And that's a battle. Because when you see impending disaster, and God is saying, no weapon by any means shall harm you, You have a choice. Are you going to believe what you see? Or are you going to believe what what he said? And that's a fight. That's a battle. And we've all fought that battle. Now, we, we need to take authority over the power of the enemy and then walk in victory. We are not to walk in battle mode all the time. I heard this said one time, and and. Somebody could take offense at this, and I don't want you to. I want you to think of what it actually says. It says, if you're warring more than you worship, then you're warped. We should war. We are in a battle. We are, but we cannot war so much that we ignore praise and worship and prayer and the peace of God that we're supposed to walk in. You know, sometimes you need to come off the battlefield and get a little R&R. And you do that through praise and worship and prayer. And Jesus said, this type comes out with much screaming and yelling. No, this type comes out with much prayer and fasting. Sometimes the greatest warring you can do is to pray and fast. You say, well, what good does that do? I don't know, but the Bible says it works. And so I I don't go by what I see. I I mean, I can't figure out why in the world does that work. I don't know. But Jesus said it did. And so it must. Hmm. Ephesians 6.13 Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, continue to fight. No, and having done all, stand. Stand how? Stand in your victory. There's victory in Jesus. <laughs> I, was, I was watching a, a church in Indonesia, and they were singing, and they were singing that song. There's victory in Jesus. Victory. <laughs> uh, for the people watching in, in Indonesia right now, I love you guys. <laughs> okay. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow, okay, now this is out of the Living Bible, 
Listen to this out of the Living Bible. And let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Well, why would we get discouraged? Well, most people get discouraged because they don't see results. That's why we're told, quit going by what you see. We walk by faith and not by sight. There should be a scripture on that. See, we need to realize that the source of all problems is the devil and sin. Some people, <laughs> some people fall into uh, bad habits and, and they create their own problems. You know, there's actually times when you're doing so, so good at being bad that the devil says, I don't want to mess with that person. They're doing a better job without me. That was humor, but it's true. Hmm. See, it may be the devil, it may be you, but it's not God. God is not the one who is hurting you in order to teach you something. This, this old phrase, and I used to hear it all the time when I was growing up in the church, well, God must have brought this on me to teach me something. If that was true, the smartest people in the world would be in the hospital. That's not true. God doesn't hurt you to teach you. He loves you. He loves you. Just quit blaming God for what happens in your life. You know, I had a man <laughs> many years ago, he said, well, you know, God gave me a stomach problem so that I wouldn't eat so much. Because if I ate a lot, I'd get heavy, and when I'm heavy, I'm more susceptible to sickness. So God made you sick so you won't get sick. Huh, yeah. See, if you're fighting the wrong source in life, you're, you're just wasting time. All this time that you spend blaming God or blaming somebody else, you need to get to the source. And then when you get to the source, you need to cut the snake's head off. If it's the devil, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Sounds simple? It is. Hmm. And if it's you, quit it. If you're doing something wrong that's bringing bad things into your house, quit it. Look, I'm not going to say that. Loretta's watching. All right. See, God, He will use the circumstance you're in even if he didn't create it. See, Romans 28, 8, Romans 8, 28 says, For God uh, causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He doesn't cause all things, but he does cause all things to work together for your benefit. All right, now, don't confuse discipline with the attacks of the enemy. Sometimes you are being disciplined. But God doesn't discipline you in a way that will hurt you. It may be disappointing for a little bit when he disciplines you. Well, what's the scripture say about this? Hmm. Well, the scripture says that when God disciplines, it's, disciplines us, it seems grievous. But it's, but it's not terminal. It's not terminal. Well, it's just like you with your kids. You may discipline them by giving them a swat on the bottom. No, I know in some places around the world you're hearing this and you're thinking cruelty, but no. My mama and my dad kept me out of a lot of trouble by threatening me with a swat on the bottom. Now, but they, they would never do anything that would cripple me. Are, are you following me? God, God's a loving God. Okay. 
So you need to understand this too. Through all of your trials, through all your troubles, when, when you see the snake, you need to understand God's inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Why would you fear when you have the ultimate creator of the universe living inside of you? See, God, what I was going to say earlier, is not only is God omnipresent and that he can be everywhere, he can be inside of each one of us separately. That's God. But he's also timeless. And see, God has the ability to go into the future and go into the past. That Hebrew word there, when, when he says, I am, that Hebrew word there for that just means I am, I was, I will be. He, see, he, was, he is outside of time. Time was created. God carved out of eternity this area called time. And then within time, he created everything that's physical. And here we are. But God sees the end from the beginning. So, you need to understand, look, Colossians 1.27, To them God will to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. He lives in you. As my grandma would say, quit being a scared of the snake. You have nothing to fear. You need to understand that God is on your side. God's not opposing you. God's not walking around with a clipboard waiting for you to make a mistake so that he can go, aha, now I can withhold that blessing. No, it's the reverse. He's walking around. Instead of looking for excuses to exclude you from the blessing, he's the other way. He's looking for excuses to include you in the blessing. All through the scripture, it talks about how God wants to bless his people. Hmm. Now, we need to understand this, John 3, 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus came not to condemn us, but to save us. Save us from eternal death. Save us from separation from God. To save us to himself. Hmm. Now, here's the deal. I know some of you are going through some things. And I, I know of a lady watching today from out of town who is going through some very serious things in her life. And uh, to her, the way she felt last week was that she just wanted to give up. She was tired. She was tired of fighting. Tired of all the turmoil. Tired of all the arguments. Tired of, just tired of everything pressing in on her. But here's a word of the Lord for you. You will get through all of this if you keep being led by the Spirit and if you don't give up. See, the enemy wants you to give up. He wants you to throw in the towel. He wants you to just say, this isn't worth it. Well, let me ask you something. Does everybody make it through the trial? No. Not everybody makes it through the trial. But do you have to fail? No. You don't have to fail. I don't care how severe this thing is you're going through. You will make it. As I've shared before, there was a time in my life where uh, I had such a pressure coming against me financially that I shared with Loretta, I said, you know, somebody said, well, maybe you'll win the lottery. And I said, it wouldn't do any good. If I won a million dollars, it'd just be one more million that they would take because it's, it's that far gone. And, and I remember people would come over to our house uh, or our home Bible studies and 
And everything would look good. We had it covered really well. Everything would look good. But when they would leave, I saw their taillights going out the driveway. I couldn't go to sleep that night from the stress and the pressure of what was on me. And nobody knew it. Nobody in my church knew it. I mean, it was before this church got started. It was before I was pastor here. Nobody at the church I was going to knew it. The only, there's just a handful of people that knew it. And some of the most powerful men in the country was trying to destroy our family through a business venture in another state. And I started having internal bleeding just from the stress. And I remember one night telling Loretta, I'd been praying about it, and like, why isn't anything happening? I can't see anything happening. The hole just keeps getting deeper. It's not getting better. And I remember one night saying, you know what? I'm just going to cast this care over to the Lord. I'm done with it. Lord, you gave me all this once. You can give it all to me again. But I'm giving up this stress right now. And that's the, the little book that I wrote 25 or so years ago called God's Plan for Handling Stress. That's where that book came out of, out of that extreme pressure. And in that night, I slept like a baby. No problem. Why? Because I took authority over the problem, and I gave it to him. I cast my care over onto him, and I don't have the care anymore. When you cast it to him, you don't have it anymore. You know, that's, that's why you can have joy in the midst of major disaster. And the disaster all comes from words. And you know what? What came against me never happened. In fact, we went through that and came out better than had it never happened. The enemy has just got one big mouth. And we've got to quit believing his mouth. When the doctor, head doctor of the cancer clinic across the street ran out in the rain in September of 2019 as we're getting in our car to tell Loretta after I've had several months of tests that I had three months to live, what do you do? Oh, we went and got a Starbucks. You know, here, here's the thing. The enemy's got a big mouth. And you can believe his mouth or you can believe the word. And it's a choice. And when you believe the word, when you submit to God and resist the devil, that cuts his head off. And that demon that's been hanging around your house telling you those lies, be gone. Now there may be another snake come around. But what do you do? You just keep doing the same thing. You know, da, 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 da. you know, <laughs> you just keep whack, whack. <laughs> I was not saying that Mahomes was, you know, okay, moving right along. Here's what you need to do. Sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. Are you following me? Because the temptation is to repeat what the devil says. You're going to fail. Looks like we're going to fail. Well, that's right. It looks like, no. Now somebody says, well, look, if I say I'm healed when I'm sick, then I'm lying. No, you say, by faith I'm healed. And I've got a message I've been working on for a long time, and I just haven't got it all tweaked out yet. But I'll tell you what, there is a difference between believing and having believed. And there's a lot of things we're believing for when we need to quit believing for them and just say, it's settled, I believed it, it's done. Because when we say, I'm believing, we're saying, well, I'm standing here and I'm sure, and in a way we're kind of saying, I sure hope it happens. I'm believing for it. I'm wishing and hoping, and you know. No. It's in whom I have believed. 
I'm not believing Jesus. I believe Jesus. Okay, well, like I say, I haven't got it all worked out yet. <laughs> but uh, maybe now I won't have to preach it. Okay, keep your mouth shut when you need to. You cannot speak doubt and call it faith. Walk in love and forgiveness. Hello. Now that doesn't mean you forgive the devil. And that doesn't mean you've got to be pals with the devil. And just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean you've you got to invite them over for dinner. There's a lot of people in my life that I have forgiven, and I don't even want to be around them ever. Okay? <laughs> but I forgave them. And I don't hold a grudge. And I'm not mad at them. And when I see them, I can be cordial but I just don't want them in my inner circle. See, sometimes people think, well, when you forgive somebody, you're kind of condoning what they did. No, you don't have to condone what they did. You still don't like what they did. But you be you. Now you may want to be friends. But be led by the Spirit. That's a good answer. Seek Him and His kingdom first. Don't seek freedom, seek Him. Now let that sink in. See, sometimes it's, we seek first the kingdom of God. Where is that? Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. So sometimes we're seeking the things, and then if we get the things, we're going to go to the kingdom, you know, like... When God comes through, I'm going to church, you know. Well, the devil will just make it to where nothing goes through, so keep you out of church. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you can't live like the devil and expect God's blessings. However, you don't have to be perfect. Don't get into condemnation. Don't beat yourself up. And just because you're going through a trial, don't get depressed and get all into self-pity. Remember, the trial is a trial of faith. The trial, the devil may be putting you through a trial, but God is not judging. The, he's, he is judging your faith. It's a test of your faith. He does test your faith. Well, I had a scripture here uh, I really wanted to give you, and I'm going to see if I can find it here real quick. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, just one moment, please. Uh, okay, when people say, well, the Bible says God tests us, and I can prove it because here's a scripture. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Believing in your heart is where faith dwells. He's, he's, he may be testing your hearts. He may be testing your faith in your hearts, but He doesn't test you through trials and tribulations. He doesn't put sickness and disease on you just to see how you're going to react. No, but when sickness and disease comes upon you, He'll test your heart to see where your faith level is. That's good. All right, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do not forget that. When you're warring, and it's okay to war, but once again, don't war so much that you forget to worship and fast and pray. That's important. Now, 1 Corinthians 10.13, no temptation, and that's once again test or trial, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. In other words, don't feel like you're all singled out. You're not the only person in the world going through this. Been a lot of people going through this before you, a lot of people going through it right now. They may be hiding it, who knows what. You're not special. Now you're special to God. You know what I'm talking about, but no temptation, trial or test, has overtaken you except 
such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So here's the deal. Whatever the devil puts on you, and I've shared this before, like with hurricanes, if if the devil comes at you with a category five hurricane in your life, God will give you category six deliverance. What if the, what if the test and trial goes up to category whatever? I don't know. Whatever it is, he'll always give you the way of escape. And what is the way of escape? It's faith. That was, that was the answer to my book, God's Plan for Handling Stress. And then you turn the book sideways, and you, if you kind of look at it kind of weird, you could kind of see the word faith. God's plan for handling stress, God's plan for handling problems, God's plan for getting you out of the mess you're in is simply this, believe Him. When you believe Him, and you believe Him so much that everything you say and everything that you do is based on that belief, you cut off the head of the snake. Now what happens when you cut off the head of the snake? It still wiggles. There's still movement there. Unless you look close, it kind of looks like the snake's still doing, still doing what snakes do. Except the head's gone. I saw a video a few weeks ago. This guy cut the head of a snake off. It was uh, some kind of a snake that had big fangs. But he cut the head off, and the head was laying there, and the body was moving all around. And the body got up near the head, and the head still bit the body. It bit its own body. So, I mean, even after the head's cut off, there's still some activity that may be going on. But he's dead. <laughs> Don't let that after activity make you think that God didn't hear you. Well, oh, snake's still moving. I guess it didn't work. No, no. Having done all, stand. Stand what? Stand in believing God. What'd God say? That no weapon formed against you would prosper. Yeah. He gave you authority over all the power of the enemy. The enemy may, may still be slithering around on the floor, but his head's gone. Okay. Jim gave me a compliment on one of my sermons last week. and that, that's, a, that's a milestone. Uh, he said, he said it was, the sermon was really great. It was only 35 minutes. <laughs> you have no idea how many times I've laughed over that. <laughs> and I thought, I'm, I'm going to go 36 this week. <laughs> yeah. All right. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. You know, that's what we need to be. Consider it all joy, brethren. Where is that, James? Consider it all joy, brethren, when, when trials come upon you. It doesn't say it is joy, but consider it joy. Sometimes we just need to laugh at the devil. The Bible says God, God <laughs> there's one scripture that says God smiles at the devil. Like, uh, <laughs> Bring it on. I've got the word, and the, sur the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Whack! <laughs> all right. Are, are you all ready to go snake hunting? Okay, no, 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 whoa, whoa. That, I shouldn't have said that. Back in the day, I remember when, the, after the Jesus movement, when all of us hippies got saved, <laughs> I remember... We, we had a Bible study over at our house one night. And this, this person said, I think I know where the devil is. And where's, we're having a Bible study at my house. Where's, where do you think? He went down your well. We need to go out and cast him out of your well. 
That's a man, let's just run the water and flush him down the toilet. We don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they were seeing the devil in doorknobs. I mean, the devil was everywhere. Don't, if you go on a devil hunt, you can hunt forever. And you find devils every day because if you cast them out, they're still here. See, what you do is you cast them away from you. What happened when Jesus cast out those thousands of devils? The devils didn't die. They went into the pigs. They went into the water. Then they went someplace else. They're still hanging around now. They're probably all out in Vegas or Colorado or something, you know, but or California. That's, <laughs> you know. but, but, but the reality is you can always find devils. Just here's the deal. Like my grandpa used to say, quit looking across the fence and at somebody else's plow. Keep your own plow clean, you know. Just keep your house clean. You keep your house clean. I'll keep my house clean. We keep the church clean. We keep our area clean. We have authority over Osage Beach and Camden and here at the Lake of the Ozarks. We have authority. We take authority over the areas that we have authority over, and we, we cast them out, you know. Somebody says, well, where did you cast them to? I don't know. It, that's, I'm only responsible for the area I have authority over, you know. Well, did you get anything out of this today? And, and Jim, what was, what was the time? He didn't time it today. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Jim and I are buddies, by the way. So, you know, I didn't take offense at it after a while. You know. <laughs> Let's stand. We're going to make a confession right now. In the name of Jesus, I will not put up with a snake in my house. Do you believe what you just said? All right. Now, you can go snake hunting in your own house, but don't you go snake hunting in my house. <laughs> I'll take care of the ones in my house. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor, and we thank you so much that you've given us authority and the weapons and, and the love and everything that we need to live peaceably in authority, with love, until the return. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen.